It is an honor to be speaking here. Um, I'm a great admirer of the work of midwives and doulas. Um, and I also wanted to congratulate the organizers on what looks like a beautiful program. I only wish I could have been here for the whole weekend, but I have family commitments. I was privileged to do a workshop many years ago with Ina May Gaskin, who wrote the book Spiritual Midwifery. So I have some idea of this, how wonderful this work is, and of course in my ongoing practice and my own life experiences. I've titled my talk, Caring for the Brilliant Immune System, from the newborn and onwards. The immune system is indeed brilliant. Its intelligence has scope and genius beyond our wildest imagination. We know so much about it, and yet we probably know a fraction of a fraction of it. And the rich complexity of its action and interactions with our whole being is beyond mere reductionist scientific study, as useful as that has been. The immune system is not isolated. The study of psychoneuroendoimmunology, <laughs> it's quite a mouthful, acknowledges the beautiful interconnectedness of these seemingly, seemingly separated systems. Mind body medicine, functional medicine, integrated medicine also acknowledge the inseparable nature of the major systems of human beings. And I'm just referring now to where science is with it. But for those of you here, I don't think you need science to understand that, these, that everything is interconnected. At the core of all chronic diseases, the immune system plays an integral role. From depression, schizophrenia and autism, to autoimmune diseases, chronic fatigue syndrome and cancer, the immune system is implicated. In other words, you name it and the immune system is there at the center. So how do we care for this amazing gift? It certainly makes sense that we do the best we can from the earliest days of its development in our bodies. A midwifery conference seems a good, way, a good place to discuss this subject. At this point I should mention that I was asked initially to share my ideas on the possible effects of vaccinations on our health. In other words, the risk versus benefit of vaccinations. As this is a subject that usually takes me a minimum of an hour to cover, I thought I would complicate matters further by expanding my talk to include the general care of the immune system. Actually, this is quite easy because any discussion on vaccination should be done in the context of the care for the immune system. It is also quite easy because we do not so much care for the immune system as provide an optimal environment for it to do its own thing. Undisturbed, it knows what to do. Of course, we all have relatively stronger and weaker immune systems, and there are various acquired and congenital problems with the immune system, but I, that is beyond the scope of this talk. For the most part, undisturbed, it does what it needs to do. As I said, the immune system is remarkably intelligent. I often refer to the study of ecology and ecosystems. It is slowly dawning on human beings that we interfere with these at our peril. There is an inherent intelligence in nature that does not respond well to being messed with. For example, when we kill off one bug, we get a rampant overgrowth of another, etc., etc. And we all know about climate change. So the first point to make on the subject after all of that is respect nature. There was, there was a time, and it is still prevalent, when it was a common belief that only hippies thought that nature was intelligent. I now find that it is intelligent people, hippies or not, who are respecting nature in the care of their and their children's health. More and more people come to me that don't fit into any bracket of society. In terms of care of the immune system, to return to that subject, a lot of it is actually dealt with in the subject, of, the subject matter of this conference. All the things that we've been talking about already 
this morning that I've heard and what I've seen on the program are to do with the ultimate way that our immune system works. Optimal care of our health, physically, mentally, emotionally and spiritually, before conception, through pregnancy, during labor, all contribute to the health or otherwise of our and our newborn's health and immune system. Again, what we are attempting to do is simply provide optimal conditions for the fetus and newborn to flourish. And it just so happens that optimal is natural. So my approach to the newborn and onwards is actually quite simply described. I advise and encourage on natural care, breastfeeding, a lot of direct warm contact, we are mammals after all, and calm surroundings, all of what you have been talking about, wherever possible. Obviously there are many scenarios where this is not possible, and I certainly don't advocate a more holistic than thou attitude. There is no judgment or guilt tripping. I believe that we are all doing our best and that is good enough. In my own personal experience we had beautiful midwifery care. We had everything set up and we landed up needing a cesarean section. We then had problems with, with breastfeeding. But we've done our best and that still fits into the scope of what we're talking about here, which is the holistic care of our health and our newborn's health. Then I use medical intervention only where necessary. Some examples. I do a lot of educating on the benefits and necessity of fever. Parents need to find their own comfort levels in this regard and this is a big subject matter on its own. But I do spend a lot of time explaining to people how healthy a fever is and really encouraging them and they find that makes a huge difference in the care of their newborn and their child and to the eventual outcome. But it takes a bit of time because there is a lot of fear around this and I do understand that. Noses must be allowed to, dry, to run, not artificially dried up. And the body must be left to fight most infections. The need for antibiotics is the exception rather than the rule. I have the added benefit of the use of homeopathy, which I find invalu invaluable in supporting these processes. Babies and children respond quickly and efficiently to homeopathic remedies for a huge range of conditions and situations. Again, that is a huge subject on its own, but it really does help with the immune system. And there are many other natural tools to support, for example, massage, craniosacral therapy, and chiropractic, to name a few. So these are some of the subjects that I know you will be discussing. I often tell people that my aim is to be minimally involved after the first and second years of life and generally this is the case. An immune system that has been supported and not suppressed works beautifully. Of course there are other times of life, there are other transitions where, where the immune system is under attack. There is, also, there is also stress and so obviously the involvement continues. But in many, many people they hardly see me after two years. And then as I say there may be puberty issues or other transition phases. And now I come to the highly emotive and controversial subject of vaccinations. I'm not telling you anything new when I say that more and more people are questioning the current vaccination regime as per the World Health Organization and that there is a huge backlash against this movement. Buddha apparently said people with opinions just go around bothering one another. <laughs> I'm obviously here to give my opinion. <laughs> So hopefully I will not bother anyone, but just take it as that. I'm not saying it's the truth, it's what I observe. With the limited time that I have available, and I said speaking on, on vaccinations alone, I usually spend over an hour and then I'm not even nearly completed. I have made five points, which I hope will stimulate some thoughts, and obviously we may have more time to discuss this. And in fact, I've, I've asked Robin because um, I've given talks to Robin's groups before and she has five points that she's taken from those that are very practical points that I haven't even been able to include in this talk. So maybe afterwards when we're talking, she can give you those five points. My first point is that the original intention behind vaccinations was noble and probably saved many lives. 
We have to remember conditions in Europe at that time. Terrible living conditions, minimal hygiene, especially with regards to clean water and sewerage. Disease was rampant. So it is hard to fully measure the effects of vaccination as living conditions for poorer people at that time in Europe improved dramatically over that period. And if you look at graphs, you will see that disease was already coming down at the same time as vaccinations were introduced. So it is hard to measure, but I do think that they had some effect. However, also, is certain vaccines still save many lives in more vulnerable communities. Measles, for example, is life-threatening in undernourished and immune-compromised African children. The fact that measles arrived in Africa later also plays a role here. So I, ha I found when I worked in KwaZulu-Natal that there was the measles vaccine on its own in that area made a huge difference to the outcome and to the, to the likelihood that, um, to reducing infant mortality rate. So that's my first point, is that I'm not here to completely knock your vaccinations. My second point is that the current vaccine schedule involves too many vaccines given too soon and is harmful for many reasons to the immune system. I could go on and on and on here. Due to the twin emotions of fear and greed within human beings, fear, we all have fear, and it's natural, and greed of, of the pharmaceutical companies, there's very little open and honest investigation of this within the scientific community. Anyone who dares to question the status quo is immediately branded a heretic and achieves a pariah status. However, recent unofficial, and I say unofficial studies for this reason, show that vaccinated children were two to five times, I'm talking about routinely vaccinated children, were two to five times sicker than unvaccinated children of a similar socioeconomic group. So that's quite dramatic. And it is absolutely my experience in practice that children with no or reduced or later vaccinations, and Robin will mention how I advise people on this, have a much healthier immune system. And this is obviously a generalization. When you consider what I said earlier about the role of the immune system in all chronic diseases, the implications here are more than just children getting sick often or needing grommets or having more allergies. We are talking about chronic disease in the end. So the better we care for our immune system and the less we interfere or damage it. I wanted to say that there are, in rare cases, there are catastrophic reactions, but it is relatively rare. Um, we all know about autism. We hear about people who've had, I have personally cases of neurological damage. And although the scientific community are saying that there's no proof of this, there's no more proof that you need than a, than a mother telling you or a parent telling you about the change of their child overnight. And the fourth point, it is important that I just complete this, is that, that I believe that many of these childhood illnesses need to be there. They're part of our development. Chickenpox is often seen as a, as a rite of passage. Measles has been shown to improve people's health dramatically. We all heard about the recent measles epidemic in, in the UK, but no one has bothered to say, let's follow up those people who had measles and see how, in fact, their immune system has improved. So, again, this is about respecting nature. It goes back to my point about respecting nature. There is a reason behind many of these illnesses. And the fifth point, finally, is that I always tell parents and Robin appreciates this, that we, do not, we cannot make mistakes and that there's no approach that guarantees a risk-free life, whether you do or you don't vaccinate. I support whatever decisions are taken regarding vaccinations. People do what they do with the best intentions and there are millions of ways in which to approach this world. As one, as one wise teacher said, keep away from being right. How right? I just want to finish with one last quote from the Tao Te Ching. And I ask you not to take it literally or, or to take out any particular part of what I'm saying and be offended, but to rather see the general message of what this quote is saying and relate to a little bit of what I'm talking about today. If you want to be a great leader, you must learn to follow the Tao. Stop trying to control. Let go of fixed plans and concepts and the world will govern itself. The more prohibitions you have, the less virtuous people will be. The more weapons you have, the less secure people will be. The more subsidies you have, the less self-reliant people will be. 
Therefore, the master says, I let go of the law and people become honest. I let go of economics and people become prosperous. I let go of religion and people become serene. I let go of all desire for the common good and the good becomes common as grass. Thank you.